Dear Father, Lord, we come to you now with the desire to live out the mind of Christ. We want nothing more than to honor you with our hearts and our lives. So cleanse our heart this morning in order to be pure and prepared to receive your word. Open up our minds to receive these truths. Shield our minds from wandering aimlessly, but cause us to be focused and sensitive to what you are about to teach us in this psalm. We are ready for you to take us on this spiritual journey. We thank you, we love you, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so uh, my name is Dennis. I am the, the children's and youth director here at Lighthouse. Uh, this is my first and last sermon before I go on Honduras. Um, that was a little play off of Joshua as he was sending uh, Kevin off to sabbatical. He used that pause in there to confuse some people. Um, today, yes, we're getting into Psalm 27, and this is a Psalm of David. Now, before we get into that, raise your hand if you remember the No Fear era. It was like the apparel that you we had, I had several hats and, and shirts that wore these no fear, right? Um, yeah, so back in the 90s, it kind of is this grunge era, uh, it, but, it, but it represented this philosophy that says that I will not fear anything in life. There's no fear of death, no fear of laziness, of contempt of social norms, or even the law. And in this psalm, David describes his no-fear philosophy. He has no fear because of his salvation. Because God is his light and his salvation. And his stronghold, he has no fear. When bad people and, and bad things happen, his heart will not be afraid. He fears nothing. But he enjoys to be in the presence of God. So our first point for today is David's confidence is in the Lord. So as we look at, at verse 1, David begins by saying, the Lord is my light and my salvation. So he's, claim, he's claiming God as his own. So you notice this personal relationship with God, my light and my salvation, is the Lord, your light, is he your salvation? Do you know God in this intimate way? Light is that which drives out darkness. The Bible, the light, can stand for life. It can stand for God's blessings or God's favor. The word uh, salvation in Hebrew is Yeshua, which is the name for Jesus. It is a word that speaks of God's ability to save and deliver from harm. In John 1, verse 5, it says, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And then if we go any further into that, at verse 9, it says that uh, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. Then, in John 3, verses 19 and 20, it says, And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. So David says, the Lord is his light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? So if we were in the midst of a tornado right now, right? Well, actually, if you're in, in the, a mobile home, a small mobile home, you might have a little bit of a cause for concern that this tornado is coming, right? Well, if you are underground in this concrete bomb shelter, then you probably have nothing to worry about. Why is that? 
because you would, re- you would be in this strong place of protection. And when God is the strength of your life, when the Lord Almighty is your stronghold, you are also in that strong place of protection. Romans 8.31 says, If God is for us, who can be against us? David wasn't afraid because God was that strong place of protection for him. So who or what is that strength in your life? Who supports you? Who upholds you? Who sustains you through daily struggles of life? Where do you, where do you look for your strength? David's first secret here is praying. Praying in crisis was that God was this very personal per, uh, relationship with him. He was David's light, his salvation, his stronghold in his life. In times of crisis, remember that the Lord is your strength. Now, another reason that David, uh, he had this confidence in the Lord was the inevitable outcome of his enemies. We find it several times where he describes these enemies, these, over, uh, these evildoers, these adversaries, foes, the wicked. But in verse 2, when evildoers assail me, to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes. It is they who stumble and fall. So David describes his enemies in very graphic terms. They are evil. They advance against him. They devour his flesh. It's almost as wild animals would devour something, right? But when they attack, they will stumble and they will fall. It's one thing if, you're, if your enemy stumbles and then keeps coming after you, right? But David says, that's not the case here. They will stumble and they will fall. They will not succeed in their efforts against him. Now, there's that emphasis on the word they there too. When they attack me, they will stumble and fall. So it's like they, they dig this pit for, for David to fall in, but they fall in themselves. It's because they are the evil men. They are not on God's side, and therefore God is not on their side. It's not necessarily a bad thing when evil men oppose you. Now, if godly people take stand against you, that's a different matter. John Wesley prayed Lord, if I must contend, let it not be with thy people. But we should, be not, we should not be surprised when the world hates us. John 15, 18, Jesus said, If the world hates you, keep in mind that he hated me first. Evil men hate Jesus because they hate God. Evil men hate Christians because they hate Jesus. It all goes way back to the garden when God said that there would be hostility and hatred between the seed of the woman and the serpent. The wicked have always hated the godly. When godly men oppose you, take heart. That means that you're probably doing something right. Besides, God will never side with evil. Therefore, Realize that your enemies will stumble and fall. We know that God is bigger than any problem that you're going to face. David says, this is true no matter how large the threat is. In verse 3, though any army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will will be confident. So some people, they, they feel that they, have, uh, they can um, handle these small problems. Others feel they can handle fairly large problems too. But there is a limit that we all reach that becomes bigger than us. Bigger than what we can handle on our own. So what then? David says, if God is your stronghold, 
it doesn't matter how great the problem gets. So I don't know many people who would be confident when we go up against an entire family or if war breaks out in front of you. I certainly don't know um, anyone like that that's that confident, but I'm pretty sure it's pretty tough odds to beat. But you never play the odds when you have God on your side. David was confident in God no matter how great that threat he, that he faced was. It doesn't matter how large the problem you're facing in life right now. God is bigger than your problems. And you can have confidence in him. Now that doesn't mean that everything uh, will turn out the way that you want it. God, in his wisdom, he might have a, a different plan for your future or for what's going on in your life. Christians, they suffer. They grieve. They're not immune to sickness and sorrow. Christians, they, lo they lose loved ones. They're imprisoned. Their dreams sometimes come crashing down around them. But God is faithful, and he will bring us through whatever problems that we're going to face. In the long run, even death cannot hurt a child of God. For death simply just ushers us into God's presence. So let's pause right there for a minute, because there are probably a few of you uh, that are here today that are actually facing life and death situations. Now, I don't want to minimize whatever problem, situation that you are going through today. But most of us are not dealing with life and death situations. Most of us are not literally praying for our lives today. But millions of Christians around the world are praying for their lives. Christian persecution is rampant around the globe today. Uh, there's Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, China, Cuba, North Korea, the list goes on and on, where believers in these countries are threatened, intimidated, imprisoned, tortured, raped, killed because of their faith. And yet they continue to trust God in their lives and in the, with their families. Not too long ago, it was actually Pentecost Sunday, 38 people died in a church in Nicaragua by a terrorist attack. They are trying to scare Christians away from the church, hopefully to, uh, to end Christianity there. Then... There is, uh, there's, there's also these possibilities. Right now, the uh, Department of Homeland Security is warning churches of credible threats if Roe versus Wade, the 90, uh, 1973 decision that legalized abortion nationwide, if it is overturned. It's, it's already started with, with vandalism in uh, pro-life centers. It's just people just vandalizing these places. So the, the threats are out there. They're real. They're happening. The person who trusts in God is not threatened by the odds, though. What did David say in verse 3? Though an army encamp against him, my heart shall not fear. The war is a rise against him, yet I will be confident. So know that God is bigger than any problem that you will face. The, the second point I want to make here is, is David is confident in God's presence. So how did David do it? Why was David able to pray with such confidence in even these, these uh, situations that he has been facing? Well, four, uh, verses 4 through 10 give us another part of David's secret. In these verses, uh, 1 and 3, we saw David praying for his life in a time of crisis. But now we move on, and he's, he's praying for this, this goodness of God. So, first of all, 
We need to come to God with this singleness of desire. In verse 4, one thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek. So how would you finish that sentence? If you could ask God one thing, what would it be? So you remember the, the genie in the bottle, right? You get three wishes. So this time right here, you get, you get one wish. You get to finish this sentence. God appears before you, and he says, what do you want? Pick one thing, and it's yours. Anything. What would you ask for? I have thought about that. I, I went back to when God asked Solomon that question. Solomon asked for wisdom to rule God's people. Now, God, he liked that answer, but I think that he liked David's answer even better. He said that I may dwell in the house of the Lord for all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in the temple. This was one thing that David wanted at all costs. Other things he could do without, but not this thing. He was not giving this up. I believe David was speaking from experience here. He was seeking something that he, had, he was just not reading about or just heard about. This is something that he was passionate about. David had tasted and seen the Lord and seen that he was good. And now he was hungry for more of what God had. Nothing else will do. Everything else is this poor substitute. And David knew this. When David talks about dwelling in the house of the Lord, he's not talking about literally living in the church building. He's talking about living in God's presence. Knowing God's presence in his daily life. Now this desire to be in God's presence is, is not completely separate from his desire, uh, desiring to be in church, to be with his people. The two, though, go together. Those who love God's presence also gathering with God's people. After Jesus' ascension, we read of how the disciples met. They continually in the, in the, met in the temple praising God. Remember, David was probably on the run when he wrote this psalm. So how he would have longed to be back in Jerusalem to worship with his people, with God's people. If you love God's presence, you will also love gathering with God's people. And I, and I hope that's why you are here this morning. So why did David long to dwell in this house of the Lord all of his days? He gives us two reasons. To gaze upon God's beauty and to seek God in his temple. So now we're going to talk about the beauty of the Lord. We're not talking about this physical beauty. God is spirit and he, he has no outward form. But Outward form is not necessarily for beauty. Music, music, for example, can be beautiful even though it has no physical form. The beauty of music comes through orderly arranging of musical tones. God is a God of perfect order. So when we speak of God's beauty, we speak of God's character, his love, holiness, his power, his faithfulness, justice, mercy, kindness, grace. A beautiful, perfect, harmonious character that thrills our beings. God, he, his beauty refers to God's pleasantness, his, his delightfulness, his goodness, and his graciousness. God's char character is delightful. It's attractive. It inspires us in this, this greater love for him. So how do we gaze upon God's beauty? For, 
some examples here, we find them in his word. In prayer, in worship, in fellowship of God's people, we gaze upon God's beauty. We fix our eyes upon him. We feast upon him, right? Well, so funny thing about that, we, uh, my daughter has a new puppy, five months old, and her name is Luna, and we came home one day, she was just out, and she decided to feast on God's word herself, and ate my wife, her, uh, her Bible, First Thessalonians is what she was feasting on, is what we found out, so... So no, we we feast upon God's word. We gaze intently, enjoying this sweet fellowship with God. It is the one thing that if you have it, you don't desire anything else. Jeremy Taylor, he wrote, uh, the new person in Christ, the new creature, asks nothing of God but to enjoy God. David also says that he wants to seek God in his temple. The word seek here means to inquire. And David wants to gaze, he wants to inquire about the Lord. To seek his will, his guidance, to know more of who God is. As Jeremiah says in uh, Jeremiah 9, 24, let him who boasts, boast about this, that he understands and knows me, declares the Lord. So why do you come to church? Is it to see other people? To be seen? To listen to the music or the message? Or is it to see God? To see his beauty? To seek him in his temple? In verse 5, David seeks God in this way. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. David's confidence in God grew out of his worship. His worship grew out of his confidence. David trusted God and he, and he who would deliver him out of this trouble that he was in one day. He knew when the day of trouble would come and what it would hold for us. That is why the book of James warns us against boasting about tomorrow. But that day never catches God by surprise. We can always trust in that. Verse 6, we talk about uh, this this joy that, that David has. And now my head shall be lifted above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. David is planning this celebration party. It's like, this is funny, because I was talking to a friend this morning, right? There was a prayer request that was sent out, and, uh, but there was no, no follow-up on what, what happened, right? So we didn't know. What, uh, what came of, this, of the prayers that were asked for. But it's like phoning in your prayer request and you immediately give the praise right after to God, right? So you can, you can picture this. Like, could you please put such and such on the prayer list? Great, thank you. Oh, could you also put the, prayer, uh, the praise report in there too? Because uh, I don't know what God is going to be doing, but I know that he's going to take care of it. Now that's the faith part, right? You know that it's already going to be taken care of. I once read uh, about this Christian minister in China by the name of Wang Ming Dao. He had spent 23 years in prison. His, His strong faith in God inspired millions of Chinese Christians. And after his release, a a visiting minister from the United States had asked him, I will probably never be put in prison like you. So how can your faith have, have an impact on mine? And Wong replied, when you go back home, how many books do you have to read 
this coming month? How many letters to write, to people to see, uh, sermons to preach? You need to build yourself a cell. When I was put in jail, I was devastated. I was an evangelist. I wanted to hold crusades all over China. I was an author. I wanted to write books. I was a preacher. I wanted to study my Bible and write sermons. But I had no Bible, no pulpit, no audience, no pen and paper. I could do nothing, nothing except get to know God. And for 20 years, that was the greatest relationship that I have ever known. So Wong went on to say, I was, I was pushed into a cell, but you will have to push yourself into one. Simplify your life so you have time to know God. And then he ended with these words right here. Revival can only come to those who make room for God. So be often in God's presence. Get to know him in his word and through prayer. Gaze upon his beauty. It's what we were made for. Our third point, even when David did not feel confident, he trusted in the Lord. Now, in, in verses 7 and 12, we find David praying for his life in a different way. David comes, uh, he's praying for his daily strength for his life. In verse 7, this is how he begins to pray. Hear, Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. David's main concern was that God hear him, not others that uh, may be hearing these prayers, but that he hears him. David's hope and assurance, assurance that God would answer was based on God's mercy. Once again, how did he know God's mercy? Because he spent time gazing upon God's beauty. When you, when you know God, when you truly know God, your prayer life will be transformed. The more you know him, the more you will love him. The more you love him, the more you will want to get to know him. The cycle will be a part of this divine rhythm of heaven, beholding God's beauty, knowing and loving and loving and knowing. Notice also that David speaks of God hearing his voice. So apparently, David he prayed, and he made these audible sounds. He was speaking loudly. Praying it loud uh, is not necessary in, in private, but it often is helpful. It will keep you on track. It will guard you against distractions. It can help you to express emotions. There's this uh, movie called The Apostle, and Robert Duvall's character, his name is Sonny, and he is in his room, and he is praying out loud, very loud. And this is in the middle of the night. Uh, I think it's like 3 in the morning, and he is just loud. And the neighbors are hearing this. And so one of the neighbors calls and talks to his mom and just asks, what's going on? And she says, oh, that's just Sonny talking to God. He gets that way sometimes. I like that. Perhaps we should all give full voice to our prayers more often. This is one of the reasons why singing is so important. It allows us to give a full voice to our prayers through song. I'm moving on to, to verse 8. It says, you have said, seek my, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. God speaks to our hearts and then our hearts speak to us. God places desires in our hearts to seek his face, his presence. But we must, be, uh, must make willing, the willing determination to follow through with that. Don't take the desire for granted. 
When your heart calls you to seek God in prayer, rejoice in that. Listen to your heart. You are at the point of spiritual sensitivity in your life. Don't take it for granted. Don't assume that you're going to be at the same point tomorrow. Stop what you're doing and do it. In verses 9 and 10, David recognizes his own sin, even as he calls on God for help. And so he prays, Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O you who have been my help, cast me not off. Forsake me not, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. So some people are rejected by their fathers, by their mothers. But David says, even though my father and mother both reject me, God will take me in. This, this, take, this word take in, to receive, uh, sometimes it means to adopt. He will, he will take care of us. He will adopt us. So God, no matter what, even though our, our humanly flesh gets in the way sometimes, God will take you in. He will receive you. He will adopt you. In verses 11 through 12, it says, Teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me in your straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desires of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, breathing out violence. So here David is saying, teach me, show me. How often do we pray like that instead of give me my way? David says, teach me your way. This is the humility of confessing personal ignorance. Lord, I, do, I don't know the right way to go. Set the path for my life. You show me the way. You teach me. You guide me. Mold me. Use me for your kingdom. So notice that David asked for this straight path, level, safe, safe and firm. When we follow God's way, we are safe and secure under God's protection. When we leave God's path, we leave his protection. We open up ourselves uh, needlessly to danger. David speaks of his oppressors here too. Teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me on a level path because of my enemies. David prays, Lord, keep me in these straight paths. Do not turn me over to the desire of my foes or false witnesses. They will rise up against me. David is committed to to going God's way. Last point here. David has full confidence in the Lord. And finally, we must learn to wait in the goodness of the Lord. Verses 13 and 14, I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. David was confident that God would redeem him in his lifetime. He was willing to wait upon the Lord for his deliverance. David is taking the long-term approach here. He's, he's praying for his life, and, but for the duration of his life. Uh, so, Verse 13, it, it breaks into uh, Hebrew here. You could almost translate it. If I hadn't believed, I will see God's goodness in, in this life. It's almost as if David is saying, if I didn't have God in my life, if I didn't believe and trust in him, and then he shudders at this, this thought. It's like he, he can't even complete this sentence. So have you ever felt like that? If you didn't have God in your life, 
I don't know what I, what I can get through. I don't know what I could do. So David encourages himself and any others who may be going through trials to wait for the Lord. Be strong, take heart, and wait for the Lord. He is kind, he is good, he is merciful. He is my light, my salvation. He is the strength of my life. So in closing, going back to that no fear that David has, in that same way, I should not fear. I don't need to fear. There may be reasons for one to think uh, to be fearful. However, because of my salvation, I should not have fear. So the, the, the biblical storyline, as we go through, we see that God's good world fell under the power of the curses uh, through Adam and Eve and the rejection of the reign of their king. The Bible recounts God's plan of redemption as it plays out the promises to Abraham, the exodus of Israel, the law of Moses, and the royal throne of David. So this plan of redemption reaches its culmination in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus and carries into the life of the church as Jesus sends the Holy Spirit to empower his people to continue God's mission. Now, Jesus often spoke of the end. In fact, holding on to the promise of the end can help us through our difficult situations that we have today. As Christians, peace comes from knowing our pain will end. Joy results in our confidence that Jesus is returning to make all things new. Paul promised that everyone who desires to live a godly life will experience persecution. We experience the joy of the Lord, but life in a fallen world is difficult and often disappointing. Praying for your life can mean praying for in times of crisis. It can mean praying for daily strength, persevering in prayer for a lifetime. So, are you praying for your life? If you are, then you know firsthand the incredible confidence that David exhibits in this psalm. Praise God. If not, then I challenge you I challenge you to pray for your life starting today. Look to God in times of trouble. Come to God for strength for your daily routine. Commit to a lifetime of prayer. Take heart. Be strong. Live with confidence knowing that God's promises are true. Promises of being with us. Promises of his provision. His goodness and his salvation. You will see God's goodness in the land of the living. We just wait for it. Wait for the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, what a wonderfully faithful God that you are. To all who trust in your name, Thank you for the example of David who reminds us that your goodness and mercy lasts from generation to generation and that all you have promised in your word is true and sure. I pray that we may be ones after God's own heart who maintains our trust in you despite the difficult circumstances that we are facing daily. I know that your goodness, you will provide us and protect us as you have promised. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.